Today, I'm speaking with Dr. D.C. Amin Hillman. Dr. Hillman, thank you so much for joining me today. Tim, it's so nice to be invited. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. You're one of my long-term uh, heroes. I love what you're doing. I absolutely love what you're doing. You are one of those people that I, whenever I see one of your videos pop up in my playlist, I'm like, we're in for, for a treat here and for a ride. I do want to mention real quick before we do the bio, uh, there's about an 80 to 90% chance that something we talk about here is going to be inappropriate for small children. So if you could, if you're a viewer, please uh, save this one for another time when little ears aren't around. Uh, with that being said, uh, let's go through a quick bio here. Dr. Hillman earned a master's in bacteriology, and he has his master's as well in classical philology and a PhD in classical philology with an expertise in ancient medicine and pharmacy, which I'm sure we'll get into at some point, which is fascinating part of the, the, the journey of understanding Christianity. Uh, his first book, The Chemical Muse, was published after his dissertation committee forced him to delete references to recreational drugs from his thesis. Well, I, I want to hear that story when we get to that part of, the, of your journey. And it actually uh, inspired the production of a lengthy History Channel documentary on the history of drug use in the ancient world. And he writes about the use of drugs in ancient mystery cults, and he tutors ancient Greek online. His website I'll have the links for what I'm going to share here uh, beneath this video, but his website is ladybabylon.com. His YouTube channel is also called Lady Babylon. His books, uh, again, are The Chemical Muse, Drug Use and the Roots of Western Civilization, Original Sin, Ritual Child Rape in the Church, and Hermaphrodites, Gynomorphs, and Jesus, Shemale Gods and the Roots of Christianity. So with that being said, uh, if you could, Dr. Hillman, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I'll just tell you a quirky little story here. I was working on a dig in uh, Megiddo, you know, the place Armageddon is supposed to happen and all that kind of stuff. And when I was there, I had two roommates on two successive nights to sit up in their beds and say the same thing to me in this real deep, gravelly voice. The head of the kibbutz where we were staying said, you know, what's going on? What are you doing to these people? Turns out we were sleeping in Jezebel's vineyard. Isn't that cool? They ran off um, on both successive nights. They ran off. The police got them both. Um, and they ended up in mental evaluation. That's what happens when you're when you're deep into that, you know, that ancient history. You're just stuck there like we are as people. You know, we're just stuck there in our history. My thing is finding that evidence that gives us the most authentic antiquity that we've got. I don't care about ideas and theories. I'm not selling people merchandise. I'm here for those texts. That's what I'm here for. Mm. And I love how so often in your interviews you bring up uh, just nuances of of the origins of words and the ways that uh, that you know the, the words evolved and what they mean. That you you really, if you're just going with the English translation, we lose so much of the richness of it. And I think you've you've pointed out well too that a lot of our those of us that have deconverted from Christianity, like a lot of our our drive at first is just to say this is a bullshit worldview. It's not real. But then as we heal from that and get regrounded and reclaim our identities, as it were, you can kind of have that freedom to go back to the Bible and say, okay. Now that I know this isn't a real God, but what is this book? Because it's got some really cool stuff. Everything from, you know, gematria, numerology, astrotheology, ancient epic stories. It's like this stuff is full of, of, of weight of little, little mysteries. And you end up having quite a respect for the people that wrote it, not because you think it's reality, but just because it's a really amazing book. Yeah. And I think it's got a lot of dirty, dirty sex and drugs. And it's got it an it's got an underbelly that people don't people don't get to see the what a lay stays actually does, and that's what Jesus called himself, right? He denied it when a cop showed up at 4 a.m. in Gethsemane. And nobody, Tim, nobody sees the naked kid that Jesus was with when he was arrested. Nobody knows what he's doing there, why he has a medicated bandage on his private parts. Right. And Jesus is raising his hands. The cops show up. He's like, ah, oh, no, lay stays. That word lay stays. That's a child trafficker, Tim. Jesus is saying he's not a child trafficker upon his arrest in the company of a naked minor. Mm, why, <laughs> why did nobody, why did none of my pastors tell me that? Why did, why did the Dallas Theological Seminary not explain that to me when I enrolled? I had to leave Dallas Theological Seminary 
because their Greek program stank. Hmm. I didn't know you went there. My, my, my parents went there. That's interesting. Um, I, I do want to get into the Greek and all the stuff with the Garden of Gethsemane and other things and the you know Zeus, Persephone, Dionysia stuff. But could I ask, just before we get into the meat of your research, which is itself, you know, could take hours and hours just to dig into the, the surface level of that. But for this, for the sake of my channel, one of the things that we love to do is just really hear people's stories. So could you take a few minutes? I, I'm not, I don't know your story, so we'll, we'll go as long as we, we need to with this part of it, and then we'll jump into your research. But could you just tell us, how did you get exposed to Christianity and what was your journey like? Sure. So just quickly, I was a child listening to Dr. J. Vernon McGee, graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary. Mm. I was a child that read Lewis Sperry Schaefer, um, Dr. Ironside, all these great commentators and just some of the greatest Baptist Christianity, theology that you could possibly imagine. So, you know, by the time I was in high school, I went to a special high school. And by the time I was um, there, you know, I was teaching Sunday school um, because the youth pastors, you guys know how it is out there, you Baptists, you know how it is. It's not always quality, you know what I mean? It's not always you know, people who are, you know, come on, we need some good teaching. So I taught Sunday school and I went to mission and volunteered at a mission where I helped to convert a bunch of people who needed conversion, mostly from alcohol, mostly from alcohol. And we fed them and they were hungry. So they were kind of forced captives, right? But I worked within the machine to create, um, men and women who committed their lives to Christ, who were born again, and who could have a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior. Um, I was there completely, right? Completely. So, can, I ask, can I ask a real quick question on what you just said? Sure. Knowing that you did preach and save some people, and I did the same thing with church and soup kitchens and street corners, do you feel guilty at this point about that? Like almost as if you want to make amends? No, not at all. I don't feel guilty about any of my converts whatsoever um, because I gave them part of an experience, a psychological experience that acted to um, submerge, submerge them really in a reality that, that um, is quantum. And I I don't I don't look back on those experiences as bad as a bad thing for those people for any of them, yeah yeah um I was I realized I was coming up too when the politics had just started permeating, um and you too I'm sure this is part of this is part of your experience as well, but um and that kind of indoctrination you know I was already used to that and rejecting the politics and the money because that scheme that Christianity is built upon of the exchange of this for that, that eternal life, which is funny. Um, that doesn't exist, by the way, for all the Christians out there, right? Um, eternal life doesn't exist. It's not a concept, right? Ionic life is the life that Jesus says he can give you, ionic life. And that's a term from the ancient mysteries. And that term was actually examined by the Pythagoreans who talked about the different degrees of the universe. There's 360. And they talk about this within the functioning of the mystery. When you say mystery, you and I look at it as if it's a fairy tale concept. There's this thing, book mystery, ha, oh, I'm partaking of it. No, no, no. It's a religious operation in antiquity. And when you read those texts and suddenly realize, oh, they're not talking like we are about a fairy tale. They're 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 um talking about people within history. Um to me, that's the real, that's the real magnetism. These texts are so on. There's so much beauty in this ancient Greek, and that's why it needs to be fiercely defended and given to people. Um, that was part of my break, Tim. I was in Aristotle, right? In order to train myself through the university, 
right? I got my bachelor's in classics. Why? So that I could go on to seminary and be able to function at a high level with competency with the text. That's all. And when I got to the seminary, what was going through my head was a lot of Aristotle and a lot of the classical philosophy and history and tragedy, drama. It's all religion, right? When you realize that their tragedies were just religious performances, you realize, oh, shoot, right? That, put that together with the stuff that, um, that, that I started to see on the medical side, and there's cracks. There's cracks, and I don't have to disprove God exists. I don't have to disprove Jesus exists. I don't, I don't care about an ism or ex, any extremity. I want those texts. And so I got to the point that um, I left Dallas Theological Seminary because the training was, I went to John Walvoord, who was the president at the time. I said, look, this is not working. It's not working. What happened? You know, I talked to him, but to his credit, he said, the standards are not what they used to be. To his total credit. Right. And so I then went on and said, well, I got to go get the tools that I need. And that's going to be on the side where classical philologists are. Because they're the mm -hmm. ones who have those instruments. Can you I know. clarify with that time, though, with in parallel with your educational concerns, were you at, through this period of, of going to church, teaching in church, doing missions? Were you what we would call in a personal relationship with Jesus, where you were praying and not just reading the, the text for the sake of learning and understanding the backgrounds and the, and the cultural context and the linguistics, but as it were a love letter that Jesus wasn't just a, a character in this story, but he was the true God and he was the lover of your soul that bought you with the price of his own blood. Like how deep were you in this? Yeah, no, I was, um, I had a very, very, and I still have a very, very personal relationship with Jesus Christ completely. You would say um, you still do? If you, yes. If you aren't born again, um, I'm sorry. Um, you, there's no admittance. If you don't walk into that temple and see that it says, know yourself, right? Jesus is just practicing ancient religion, right? That's all he's doing. Um, so um, if you can't, have that relationship, um, then there is no reality. I had and have a very personal relationship. Now, once I found out he was arrested with a naked kid, things went kind of, uh, nah, I don't, I'm not sure. And it was downhill. Um, as I increased my capacity for reading, and this is what I'm talking about, Tim. There are people out there, and your audience will be able to appreciate this. They will throw in your face, I do Greek, or I do Hebrew. They'll do that, and then all of a sudden, you don't know whether what they're talking about is accurate or not. Somebody like me can hear it on the classical side, Greek and Latin. Can hear it? Why? Because, and I train people. Now, that's what I do. It wasn't. I train people to be able to access those original texts. That's mm -hmm. all I do. But in the process, you can hear it when somebody's off and when they're not on a text like they should be. That's the, the, that only comes from reading everything. And we have so, so much. You know the popular stuff. I have seen a, just a huge sea of stuff that I can mention authors to you that you will never have heard of, but were ex incredibly important in antiquity and quoted and, and, and uh, have beautiful, beautiful stuff. I mean, amazing, amazing. That's why, that's and you're why saying some of that stuff is woven into the new Testament. Um, it's not like it's woven in. It's a document the all those individual letters and gospels are documents from antiquity. We treat those the same as you would Homer, as you would Virgil, as you would any of the contemporary Roman authors. Those are treated the same. This is not magic la-la world. I taught in seminary. 
This is not that world, right? This is not, we have these texts, they belong only to us. No, they're just another set of texts from the ancient world. So in that context, there's nothing woven into them. They're as completely native as something written in Hellenistic um, Alexandria, like the Septuagint, the thing that we call the Old Testament. Its original is not Hebrew. That Septuagint is a native Greek work. Yeah, it's a native Greek work. Linguistically, I'm saying linguistically, right? And it's coming from the third century. Those terms that are being used, I can show you that those terms are coming from Hellenistic Alexandria. Mm. Fantastic, fantastic. Before we get into some of that, I do want to step back saying, because you, you kind of threw me for a loop when you said you still have a personal relationship with Jesus. I wasn't sure if you were speaking tongue in cheek there, but I'd like to understand what you mean by that. Um, you you don't actually believe that Jesus is the real creator of the universe, right? Do I believe that Jesus is the real creator? I don't believe anything, okay. right? I am an investigator. I'm a worshiper of reason the classics have defiled my brain they have enabled me to reach up and it's a stretch man coming from anglo-saxon it's a stretch to reach up to fill the capacity that the greek has that's yeah. who i am so um, when you say I, you have a personal relationship do i believe do i believe in anything no no, I don't. I believe that reason is what gives us the human right to proceed forward into yeah. the frontier. That's it. If it doesn't stand with reason, do I have a personal relationship with Jesus? You, you, you better believe it. We've already been wrapped up together into history, so you better believe it. So you mean yeah. that in the sense of like someone that loved Shakespeare's works and was just a master of it would say they have a personal relationship with Shakespeare, not that they're calling Shakespeare a, a God or a divine figure or something. It's just you're, you're, it's part of your story at this point. There's a deeper, there's a deeper level than that. You, you and I both know that. Well, I was given a talk once and a guy came up to me at the end of the talk. This is in Gloucester. Um, and it was a gentleman who had been molested not not just molested raped raped full on by a priest and it was one of the priests that first broke they made a movie about this guy i didn't know they just walked up to me and at that it was boston that old boston breaking of the child rape with the priests anywho he was crying he came up to me after talking he was crying and i had been giving a talk on ritual rape in the early church. And he, with tears in his eyes, he came up to me and he said, you don't know what you've done. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, what is it? And he said, you have tapped into the heart of what they do. He said, I saw in my priest rapist eyes exactly what came out of your mouth. And all I was doing, I wasn't giving him ideas, all I, or you know, academic foolery. All I was giving him were the texts on the ritual rape. All I was doing was bringing that out, reviving it for them to see historically. Does that guy have a personal relationship with Jesus? You, you darn straight he does. Will he ever lose that relationship? No. No. Will I? No. I've been there. Other people have been there. Julian the apostate, right, has been there, although he was kind of hiding the whole time because they just killed all his family. <laughs> Never mind. Well, you, Never I think you I think you're using the, the 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 idea of a personal relationship with Jesus in a slightly different way that I mean, but I think I understand. So um as long as we're we're clear, we're not we're not telling our audience that they're sinners in need of a savior and that Jesus is magic blood will save you. Um but going back to your story, could you tell us when you were looking at this? and you began to see the texts more and more for what they were, at what point did you begin to question the the whole narrative of whether or not uh, the, you know, the Christian worldview is accurate, that, that there really was 
uh, a sin issue and that Jesus really was the real actual savior uh, of people's souls. Yeah, you know, I don't think there is a particular time when that congealed together. Um, as I investigated and just aged and investigated the texts themselves, yeah, um, there came a point that I could no longer morally uphold what Christianity is. Um, and if you want to say there's one seminal moment when I said I cannot go back, um, is the boy moment. As, as soon as I saw that in the original, and look, there's also a text that's been, the, the scholar who discovered it and translated it got in big trouble for doing it, kind of got repressed, but we do have a text of pseudo-Clement um, that talks about Jesus doing things with kids, and he's doing sexual things within the context of the mystery and when people look, you want a lightning moment, try this one. Um, what happens when you realize that the apostles are teenage boys? They're not adults. They're teenage boys, all of them. And John, the youngest, is probably about 10, 10 to 12. Um, that, where do you get that, right? Nobody ever questions that. Your audience, I'm sure, right now is looking around like, what, right, when you, when you do this? But, um, yeah, wake up. Wake up and look at the text, right? They're those mathetes. They're not grown men. That's why they live so long after he does, the ones that make it. That's why they live so long, because they're just kids. And now you understand why he's walking around calling them his little sheepies, his children. He doesn't, he doesn't trust them as an equal. He's a 30-year-old man talking to children right? Taking them to an upper room and a shady set of circumstances. Now, with the guy with pot, and this is going to happen. If you follow, if you follow just the mystery terminology, right, you have to be led to the conclusion that something is actually going on, that when he raises his hands and he says, I am not a child trafficker, um, the, you know, I think that's it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Look, I've been into the ancient cult. This is maybe an additional way of answering your question. I've seen the ancient cult. I've seen it. I've worked with the text. I've worked with the magic text that nobody looks at. Nobody studies these things. And they all have, you know, there's this German scholar back in the 30s. The German classicists in the 30s were extraordinary, just like the Brits about two decades before them. Extraordinary, you know? Um, this is the good period when they're editing text that nobody reads, right? And I go back to these texts and begin reading into the cult that's going on around the mystery and how the mystery is executed. Dude, you can trace all that stuff just through the drugs if you want, and it all becomes sexual, and that kid that was with him, there's one author from antiquity that says that kid is the one that had that antidote originally. They said that antidote they tried to give Jesus on the cross was for dipsas, right? And if you know anything about the drugs in the ancient world in Greco-Roman culture, you know straight up, man, those things are the, the dipsas is the one that they give you. It makes you super thirsty and you're like, ah, gotta have some water and you start losing it you start losing it why because that's what they're trying to put you into prophets are mind altered people when ezekiel stands up there i told you the original is more interesting when ezekiel stands up there and he's has the hand of god punch him into the eremon if you don't know what that is it's because you you don't know drugs in the ancient world. It punched him into the Eremon. And what did he experience? What did he see? He went through the wheels, the wheels. And everybody's like, oh, the wheels of Ezekiel. Oh, it's a this and it's a ring. No. And if you've ever read any of the texts around this, you're like, huh, what? Right? They're drugs. The trochoi in Greek are drugs. Now, all of that was translated from the Greek back translated into Hebrew. 
not just any Hebrew, but a dead Hebrew, a liturgical P Hebrew in the 11, 10, uh, 1,000 to 1,100, Anno Domini. So the word there, because ancient Hebrew only has an 8,000 word capacity. This is unique words, 8,000. Some people say 9,000. I don't think it's, I, I don't know. I'll leave that to the Semitic scholars. I don't think it really matters at that point, um, whether you get an extra thousand. What are we talking about with the Greek? Your English, modern Hebrew, 60,000. Modern Hebrew is flourishing. Yay, good job, right? Languages live and die, right? It's a struggle. It's nature. It's a struggle. Oh, love that Tower of Babylon stuff. Anyway, it's a uh, strike for survival. How many unique words are there in, in English? Oh, probably upwards of maybe 120,000, right? M maybe more. How many are there in ancient Greek? We don't know for certain, but it looks like there's at least 250. And I've seen people projected as high as probably like more 500,000. You have to realize that this language is developing over a long period of time, and it is sweeping everybody else. People don't know it, but the Romans, those hut-dwelling backwards knuckleheads the on in antiquity, the only way that they progressed was a Greek woman came to them and taught them how to write an alphabet. Isn't that nice? That's the, that's the way to go. That's the power structure in antiquity. You didn't understand that about the oracles. You didn't know why Paul was being chased around by a Pythia. And why it is that she's saying, this dude, he's doing the Christ thing. Why did that upset him so much? History and Acts. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. well, real quick, before I, I want to dive into some of these details, but I just want to go back to your story for just a moment and then go right back to maybe... Um, the Garden of Gethsemane story to kind of clarify some things for viewers that maybe are new to these ideas, because I'm sure some of my viewers have seen you before and, and would know where you're, or they're tracking with you and others would not. Um, but just when you got to a point where you said, I can't believe this worldview anymore, this is not re ultimate reality. How difficult was that for you to kind of reclaim your identity? And how did you deal with questions of the afterlife for yourself at that point? And just like what changed? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, what really was different for me was I had a buffer. I didn't reach a point that I said, oh, my God, this stuff is garbage, and I'm going to jump off the cliff. I didn't have that point. When I was about 11, when, yeah, I think I was 11, I got down on my knees in my bedroom and asked for wisdom, right, and opened up a book and saw Sophia is crying in the streets and she's being pursued by men who want to kill her. And she's knocking on your door. Will you take her in? She says, if you take her in, she'll stay with you the rest of your life. Isn't that nice? I was like, yeah, heck yeah. I want that. That's what I want. I want Sophia. Cause she was beautiful, man. The text described her. She was beautiful. Right. From the from the book of Proverbs, you mean? Yeah. Is that is that the one it is? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Some wise guy wrote it, I heard. Um, but what happened? What happened? Um that buffer um followed me. So that by the time that I realized, as you're saying, that Christianity um was not what I thought it was, um, I had already been introduced to the muse on the classical side. And that's exactly who Sophia is. She is that Musa, right? And, um, you know, so I had a very gentle buffer from the classical world, from the pre-Christian classical world kind of inserted into my operating system. It wasn't as drastic a, oh my God. Now, I will say I had a drastic moment when I found a naked kid with Jesus. At that moment, I said, you must either stand with this or against this. And I wasn't about to stand with a pedophile. I'll, 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 I'll just make that clear to everyone. As soon 
as I saw Jesus for what was going on. Mm. Okay, okay, Blaistes, he's working as a Blaistes. And all of a sudden, the entire text makes complete and total sense. And it mm. makes sense um, um, from a historical standpoint. I don't have to introduce you to any ideas. All I got to do is show you Greek words and stuff coming out of Jesus' mouth. Yeah, that was right? very but, similar with me for the genocides of the Old Testament. That was exactly what started my deconversion process. We're singing a song. Remember that song, Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho? And that was just, that. we're just, I've got small children. We're sitting, sitting around, or I should say, standing around spinning as we do. We, I learned quickly that kids like will do Bible time a lot better in devotions if you're having fun. So we wouldn't sing our songs. We would sing and spin. And we're spinning around singing Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho, laughing ourselves away, getting dizzy. And it, for the first time in my life, it struck me. I am about to teach my kids genocide, land theft, slavery, child bride, stoning, and worse. And I'm going to have to defend it. And it was like, oh my God, what am I teaching my kids? And it took me three years from that point to get out. But it's amazing the the, the ways that these, you just, you, you, you realize you're more moral than the God character. <laughs> you're, you're more loving than the psychopathic Yahweh. Um, before we, I do want to, again, go back to the Garden of Gethsemane second, but last question though, um, how did you deal with the afterlife? Um, could you be a little more specific? What, give me. Did a you little... did you conclude you've lost you'd lost it at that point that you have just one life and nothing else? And was that a, a loss to you? Oh, I see what you're saying. No, by the time I got there, um, ionic life was a part of the equation. I'd already seen the original, so the whole thing of eternal life, um, it didn't impact me. I didn't think, oh crap, I'm, I'm now I'm gonna go into hell. What is ionic? <laughs> I mean right oh no I'm, I'm going to hell right because i had cracked the the weakness in our lens that we look at the bible with already so mm -hmm. i knew that there was something going on the ionic life didn't scare me but no 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 definitely definitely but that fear that you're talking about is exactly what the ancient authors who wrote about the dangers of christianity that's exactly what they said is that that's that fear you generate. I, I, I truly do feel terrible sympathy, you know, for Christians, evangelicals. I'm not talking about your average Catholic who's going through the motions. I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who have been born again into eternal life. I feel bad for them because that fear is, as you know, that fear is a, is the essential motivator of your religion. You love Jesus because Jesus gives you eternal life. And if you don't love him, you don't have eternal life. Um, think about that. It's the same quandary we see in Job, right? The devil knows, right? God's the first liar, right? The devil knows that. And the devil says, you can get this guy. Um, to curse you just by taking away his stuff. What happens? He takes away his stuff and then restores it. And Job is sitting around watching. Has anybody ever thought? Job is sitting around with a new family. All his other family were killed. And for that, he's a good follower of Yahoo, right? To me, the logic of that is so masterfully on the devil's side. You want to see who God is? He's somebody who will kill your friggin' family, right? To prove a point. <laughs> and Crazy. Christians, Christians love that. Oh, they do. Because, because the Christian operating system is one of the fear of God. Mm. It's the fear of God. When you lose that fear of God, because people like your situation, watching somebody do a genocide, well, how can we... That's why my first name's David, and I never use it. My middle name is Amon. I never used David because as soon as I figured out, I was reading, I was like, David slaughtered a village of women and children to please the Lord? Really? You mean the stuff in Gaza is pleasing to the Lord? It is. Think about that for a minute. Oh, my God. And you know what? I've got lots of Israeli friends. People don't really, because I worked there for a year. People don't realize that your average Israeli thinks Christianity and this religion of Judaism are BS. Most of them, most of them, 90%. And they mock 
the religion and they get angry because it's destroying their justice system. People don't realize that. You think that they're, this stuff, this sacrifice, this child sacrifice, you turned away from Christianity because there's something in you that followed that was this pole of decay, pole of justice, pole of nemesis, right? The eye of justice is always on us. You can't justify killing a village of people. I don't care if you are God, right? Mm. Oh, my God. I Can love it. What does ionic life mean? Yeah, um, it is life within ion. Um, ion is that space that is outside of time. So what affects us within the time stream um, is a reflection. This is how they looked at it, is a reflection of that ionic existence. So um, they're look at, look at, they look at it physics-wise as the space outside of chronos. It's a space outside of time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is that the sort of like as above, so below concept? Um, as above, so below. I don't know is, is, if that's particularly related. I can't make it connection in my mind. Okay. But um, um, as above, so below is standard magic practice. Right. But I mean, how, you you mentioned um, like you you escaped because you feel like you had already gone onto an ionic mindset. You, you Christ, leaving Christianity wasn't that painful to you. Could you connect the dots for me? What what did it mean? Like where were you emotionally and psychologically with this ionic mindset that realizing the Christian worldview is not ultimate reality? That it didn't mean that much to you. Like what was what was going on in your heart? Yeah, see that that's the one difficulty we have is I cannot it, I don't. I don't see it as non-reality. There is a Christian reality and it's very real and it's shaping us. Those forces are shaping us. For example, the assault on democracy, it will happen over and over and over again. Right. A return to classical thought is what brings revivals of democracy. It's what brought the United States, right? That happens throughout history. Um, I don't have to believe it or not. Jesus is a reality, very much a reality. Um, I mean, like, like, you know how sometimes you'll see maybe in some big hall or some church building where they've got dozens of different light fixtures and you'll see this, you know, the electrician put in like, like an electrical box with like 12 different switches and, you know, you can flip, flip them all up, flip them all down, but there's, there's a whole bunch of them. And if you imagine that, you know, you're, you're in this big building and there's, again, a 12-gang 12, 12 electrical box, and each one of those represents some aspect of our life and experience in our world. So you flip one off, all the humans are gone. You flip another one off, the earth is gone. You flip another one off, the solar system. You keep flipping them off. Everything's Everything in the known universe is gone. When it's dark and there's, there's nothing that we can perceive is left, is God still there? Is Jesus still there? You would say no to that, correct? No, because I'm not an atheist, right? Oh, really? Okay. No, no, of course not. Um, look, when you turn off all the lights, you can still have love. You can still have that eros, right? But if the no one's there to have it, how the, could there be love if there's nothing left? The founders. Oh, that's interesting. Let let me address that. The founders of Orphism. The ones who created the mystery created it around the embrace of Eros. Um, um, these are real, if you want to call them forces, you can. They call them daimones, right? Real power. We, tr we translate that as demons, right? Um, these are real forces. So, no, I can't deny even um, the kingdom of Christ um, when... I can deny that that has authority and power. I can deny that. I can't deny that it's a relevant existing thing. And I don't want to because I've seen the other divinities through classical philology, not just myth, through classical philology, how their mathematicians approach their divinities, right? Because everything in nature Everything in nature is this existence that you and I are, this great mother, 
This is her. If you don't, if you don't believe in a great mother, it's probably because you didn't have one. You know? So you would, would you say that in the same way that you would say that you're a believer in Jesus of sorts, would you equally say you're a believer in, in Zeus and Persephone and Dionysius? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Zeus just means God, right? Um, am I a believer in Zeus? Um, you know, Zeus has his way, right? Am I a believer in Yahoo? Yahoo has his way. He's a liar. Um, you know what I really believe in now when it comes down to it? Eve. I believe in Eve. And everybody gravitates toward those divinities that they um, recognize, that they recognize. And I recognize Eve. That's what I, there's a voice throughout history. There is a, an oracle, an oracular power, a prophetic power throughout history. And it is housed within these female divine sources of inspiration, right? Um, people say there aren't really polytheists anymore walking around. The real achievement of Christianity is that it was able to kill polytheism. It was able to kill it. All of the Judaism, Islam, Christianity, the stuff that they were doing in Egypt under what's his name when he made the Akhenaten. When he made, yeah, Akhenaten is that who it was? Yeah. Fantastic. Those movements to destroy polytheism. You think it's the mythology. It's not. It's the concept that there are ruling powers in nature, that you and I are subject to certain powers. For example, the most important one that they had to set up before they could get democracy was justice. Justice. Justice is your temple. It's your holy temple. Now, you say, oh, I believe in justice, right? You only say you believe in justice because you're a Christian. You're a product of a Christian culture. There's no justice to believe in. I worship justice, right? I worship. Do you worship justice? Does he or she worship justice? That's how. That's how we create a society that can be a democratia, that can be a place where the neighborhood rules, right? When we are just. And how do we get to those places? Purgations through the theater, we bring into the theater the corruption and we purge it. And when we see that purge, we understand as citizens how to uplift those daimones, those gods of things like democracy and justice. If you don't live by the rule of justice, um, you're, um, it's only because you're an atheist. This is how they're looking at it in antiquity. The people who are struggling against the Christians, this is how they're arguing with them. They, the Christian, the first title the Christians got was the atheist. Imagine human civilization set up, set up courts, set up places of justice. Christianity said, that's not a God. We don't want that. We are servants mm -hmm. of a God we fear, period. That's it. Well, can can I throw in this question? And and I'm sorry, I keep keep on taking us away from the Gethsemane story. But uh, you've opened up a can of worms, as it were. And I I, I love that though, because it's good to go down uh, these different rabbit trails. There's a lot of talk about uh, you know people get asked sometime in these surveys, "Are you a Christian?" And we see the numbers are appearing to go down, where society is saying more and more. No, I'm not a Christian, and and some people are even brave enough to start saying yes. I definitely just don't believe in anything, or I'm just, I'm, I'm a nun, n o n e. And we're seeing the church basically starting to slowly empty out, and it sounds like. Well, let I me mean, just ask you this way: what what do you do? You, do you think Christianity is dying? Number one, and do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? That's the best question. I've ever, and I don't want to speculate at all, but since you asked me, um, 
I think Christianity is exactly where it should be within the prophetic oracular um, pronouncements of where it would be. They are perfectly fulfilling exactly what the prophet said would be fulfilled. So in a, in, in a sense, they're more powerful now than ever. If the light of justice is squashed from America, if, it's, if the light of our own self-control, if our republic falls, it will only be at the hands of those Christians who are those movers of tyranny. It'll be them. It'll be them that causes it. Thomas Jefferson said um, the greatest risk to the fledgling, he called it the fledgling democracy, is the Christian church. And when he's, I have his private letters. It's a book that I stole from a professor. I never gave it back to him. Um, um, I just forgot. It's in my collection. I'm sure he didn't care. But um, it's a it's a letter letters and. You know what Thomas Jefferson is doing? He composes ancient Greek. He's been there to that place that he understands. The Christians right now, the evangelicals right now, are trying to rewrite the history to tell you that I'm scheduled for a debate with one of them. Right? They're trying to they're trying to say that you know our society, democracy, this is all inventions only made possible by people who follow Jesus. Right? No, historically, what's the actuality? Christianity is a constant and eternal opponent of democracy, right? Because they are atheists. They do not believe justice. They do not believe that the muse inspires people. They do not believe that life is something that is beautiful, right? It's a hellacious, it's a, it's a hellacious recreation of an event from the third century BC when somebody, and I don't have to say BCE for all of you out there, you academics, BC, take your E and stick it. It was always BC, right? I know Domini too. Give shout out to the shout out to the church idiots who preserved the Latin. <laughs> well, can I ask this? You, you've, um, you made me think of a, an, another topic uh, or another conversation I had recently where somebody was saying, we struggle with, as atheists a little bit with the question of nihilism and, you know, is there really a meaning to it all? Is there a purpose knowing that, you know, say, say an asteroid 5,000 years and we're, say we're still, still not a, a planet that has um, evolved to a Star Trek level where we're exploring the stars, but it's just us on this planet. We're still stuck here for relatively an asteroid comes and destroys it. And it's just like world history effectively meant nothing. And so you look at these things from a nihilistic perspective and think, if there's no afterlife, does it really matter? Yada yada. But this this other person I was speaking with was saying, in a sense, the Christians are are even more nihilistic because what they're saying is, this life really doesn't matter. The only life that really matters is the one to come. Like in other words, yeah, it matters here because you need to make a decision for Christ. You need to get that transaction done. But apart from that, and you need to of course do good deeds so you can have a crown in heaven. But apart from that, like the real life. The, and especially even just comparing the time frames, like this life is like a little blink of an eye, and that life is just forever and ever and ever and ever and ever in a way that we can't even fathom. It's going to seem contrastingly with the time issue alone, as well as things like the glory of it all, as if this life meant next to nothing. And and in a sense, they're the greater nihilists because they're they're literally throwing away their one true life, you know. Ha- well, how does that strike you, that discussion? And, and do you think Christians are nihilistic in, in the sense that just like they're not truly worshiping justice and they're truly, you know, in the apocalyptic sense, they truly want to bring on the end times like gangbusters. They want the darkness to fall because they think Jesus, that's going to bring on Jesus's return. Do you see them as, in a sense, nihilistic as well? Yeah, nihilistic and sadistically nihilistic, as if the pain is a whole part of the process of the nothing. Yeah, right? All of that. I love your comment. All of that history. What did it mean? <laughs> right? right? That's exactly what Greeks are doing. They're sitting back and saying, what is the sense of all of this, right? Um, I'm totally I'm totally in there to say, yeah, it is, it is nihilistic. And Celsus recognized that. Um, you are giving 
everything. You're giving your existence up. They readily would agree. Yes, for Christ, take up your cross. You know, put down your rights. You don't need your rights. Take off your, your money and everything that, you know. Um, by the way, the love of money is root of all evil. That's not original Jesus, right? He's taking that from somebody else. That's okay. That's okay. Um, you can take their money. You can take everything away from them. No, you can't. This is the beauty. Modern evangelicals, you can't do that with, right? This is the gorgeousness and gorgiosity of the whole uh, um, Armageddon. This is the end, right? This is the beauty of it is they are very much a part of the material and they're very much part of the power and the surging for power. Right. Remember, it's that movement that enables in classical antiquity that enables what's called one third time or Bacchic time um, mania. It's all about mania, baby. Right. That control of that person. When I'm sitting there, when I'm sitting in the pulpit and I have a congregation in front of me. And somebody can come forward and I can lead them to Christ. That operation, that mystery operation is a binding. On the magic side, they said that's a binding, right? This person is bound. The Greeks understood this binding capacity and used the Bacchic rites, who remember, he's divine. He is that first. He's saying all the soter. He's saying everything about everything you associate with Jesus is ultimately Bacchic, right? And when I say Bacchic for your audience, I'm talking about 1100 BC, okay? This is late Bronze Age religion evolving, and the mysteries emerge in this Bacchic ecstasy, right, where you are taking the blood, you 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 have to people wonder why is Jesus the eating the flesh and the drinking of blood because those are the vehicles for the mystery right if you don't understand that you don't why are you sitting there what are you doing you realize when you take communion today that is nothing even remotely of what the original mystery was it is nothing it is not the operation of a mystery I could show you the operation, but you would be so flabbergasted that you'd probably outlaw any sort of video or audio of what I was doing. I have tried to do this, Tim. I've tried to walk interviewers through what happens in the mystery. One person just hit the eject button halfway through, never heard from, didn't publish the interview, right? You have to... You, uh, well, you want to do it? You don't. You, you don't realize. Uh, I'm sorry. What's that? You want to you do it? You want to walk through it? Sure, sure. Are, are we yeah. going to get Are we going to get uh, in trouble for for what we're about to hear? <laughs> we may. I don't. I don't know. You have editing power, so. <laughs> well, let, let's 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 give it a whirl. We'll get back to Gethsemane in a few minutes. Yeah, tell, sure. tell us tell us about the mystery cults. It turns out. It turns out, and somebody right now is trying to make a short film about this for the European Film Festival, right? Just to capture this very um, setting um, and uh, this very act. So what is the mystery initiation? How? What's the process? Okay, it's, you're, okay, don't get queasy. But this is a practice that involves the use of communion. This is a practice that involves somebody's body producing a substance through the flesh that you and I can use. That substance will bring us to death and back to life. We go into the pit and we come out. And what do they call us when we come out in late Bronze Age? Speak, they say, we're born again. That experience causes you to be kicked out of the time stream in an ionic way so that you can perceive what your existence actually is so that when you're brought back you can then live your life knowing how the outside the ion affects time it allows you and you say people are People are doing this. They're doing it to the extent that guys like Cicero are saying, if you haven't been through it, you, you can't live. 
You don't know what life really is. So, but here's the here's the part that's gonna uh, it's gonna be stickler, right? The drugs that they're using are derived from people. They are actually milking. For example, there is a milk from a priestess that produces the it's the antidote to the burning purple. When you have the burning purple, and what do they do with the burning purple? This is a mollusk. This is a mollusk in the Mediterranean, and you can make a dye from it. They also make a drug from it, right? The dye is the drug. And they use the drug in a way to induce this death, right? They bring you to death. But as they're loading you up with this, and by the way, they administer it rectally. Rectally. Do you know why Mary Magdalene has an alabastrin? Right? She's got the expensive drugs that you can rub onto the medicated dildo as an applicator, and you can insert it rectally or vaginally. And in the member, this is not odd, because at the time when you worship Bonadea, you've got 20,000 women all engaging in a communal sexual exercise with their medicated wands so it, it's not it's you know um somebody big in rome gets in trouble for trying to infiltrate it but um it's a process it, the, the, there's no distinction in antiquity between the religion the the um, medicine and the cult practice the actual mystery performance it's a healing they're they're looked at as these you know it to bring yourself out of life into what you and I look at as death, and then to yank the person back into the time stream, that's a medical procedure. So they, what the priestess does is she gives you the medicated dildo. Now, before she's done this, they have loaded you with psychosis-inducing drugs. And these are the ones that we're finding on the hair of the offerings and the menorca, for example. This is real Bronze Age pharmacological tech High, high tech here. And what they do is it, they induce the death state, but as they're doing it, you have satyriasis. Satyriasis. And you think, what is satyriasis? Satyriasis is uh, um, induced by the drug satyrion. And what does satyrion do? It not only has scopolamine and atropine to make you nutty, to induce psychosis, Right, but it also has a drug that they call aphrodisiacs that cause you to have an erection that is unremitting. After six days, they say by the seventh day, you kill someone, right? Doing this, whatever it's doing physiologically to them, maybe it's the blood pressure is too messed up. I don't know, but it can cause death. So when the person is being put under, the priestess is masturbating them to the point of the orgasmo, that peak. That, so you have to understand, they're entering death, and what are you? You're also bound. You're also bound. Why do they have to bind you? Because they're giving you psychosis-inducing drugs. Something happens to you in the state of orgasm when you are dying, and they say the effects of the thanasimone, the thanasimone are the drug, are the drugs that induce death, right? And they have this whole class of drugs that induce death, and there's overlap with what you and I would call their anesthesiology. I had to pass a series of exams to go on to dissertate, and in those are my qualifying exams. And my specialist, John Scarborough, had to give me an exam. And the exam was a series of questions, one of which is, what is it in ancient anesthesiology that is used most standard to induce a state that you can perform surgery on? Is it the opium? Is it the mandrake? What is it? So um, all of those drugs that are being used um, are kind of pioneered through this religion they have witches 
right, who are able to perform these acts on you. For example, in antiquity, if you lose your erection, if it's a problem with your right, where do you go? You go to the priestess. What happens? She ends up giving you all sorts of drugs and whipping your genitalia with stinging nettles. Um, you know, it's a process whereby you can bring resurrection. So you've got your patient. Now, remember, these are generally youths. Okay generally youths so the sexual activity that's going on here we would today consider it you know um under age under age yeah there's a reason they refer to the priestesses a certain way and there's a reason they refer to the initiates when that priestess has um engaged in the process of stimulating that boy she feeds that boy her own breast milk, which Galen says is an exudate that is not, it's not milky looking. Why? Be, and he says those breasts that they get it from, they're underdeveloped. They're in the budding stage, right? What's happening to these priestesses? They're on their own drug regimen. How do they, how do they apply? You know what they're using? They're using serpent venom. Ooh, devil right? They're using venoms, combos of venoms, and you can't swallow venoms. Everybody knows that. They break down, right? What are they, how are they applying them? They're applying them through incisions. They're making themselves that they cover with medicated bandages. Within the medicine that's impregnated in the linen um, are these venoms that slowly leach into your system as you're using it to treat a wound, Right. They also use them. You, I've seen them applied to the eyes and I've seen priestesses urinate and what looks like from this Latin text actually ejaculate rather than urinate. It's unclear, but he, um, it says the person's face smells like a brothel afterwards. So I'm assuming it's not just urine. Um, yeah. But um, so she's got, you're talking about your priestess in your right, right? I'm still talking about the mystery and what's happening. You're talking about your priestess in your right. She's using the alabastron on you. You've entered a state of forced arousal and you're, you're dying. You're, that thanasimone is taking over. But as you're dying, your respiration rate drops. She is inducing orgasm. And they say the most important part. Remember, you're psychotic. Right. At this point, you're psychotic. She is singing. Right. They say it was the most important part of the ritual is the song. Apparently, what she can do with that song in the process of you going under and coming back, and the only reason you're coming back is because you drank her breast milk. That's all. It's the only reason. By the way, the breast milk girls who have the grape-like breasts, those girls are on um, those... Um, viper venoms that we know for a fact are prolactin inducers. They interact with, um, they, they activate, excuse me, the pathways that prolactin activates. It kind of makes sense. If they're going to produce the milk, they have to be able to, to, um, to have these hormones on board. Something, you know, I talked to a doctor once in Australia, um, a toxinologist, not a toxicologist, but a toxinologist. He does snakes. And they, they do research on Parkinson's and venoms. Anyway, he said it's probably the closest, you know, closest we can speculate is it was probably antibody um, mediated responses that, they're, that are coming through the breast milk, quote unquote, to the child. Now you think about it and remember that gods are fed. Gods are fed on this milk. Right. This is how you get gods. Right. You know why? Your eyes will be open and you'll be just like him. When your eyes are opened, right, the facade falls down and you understand your place in the universe and you cannot serve a God like Yahoo. You can't serve him. Right. It's a lunacy. It's a, it's a, you, um, you create madness in order to instill reality. And they call that breast milk galene. 
It's the storm. They describe it as the, the calm after the storm. So apparently when the patients come out of this and they go through a period of where they, they um, say they look dead for all intents and purposes, they look dead, right? Ultimately they come out of it. They're revived. How do they revive them? They ghetto them. They resurrect them. They bring them from a state of sleep or torpor to a state of life, right? And so um, afterwards, you're changed because you have a different perspective. It's these people that have the ears to hear, right? It's these people. That very expression, ears to hear, is an Orphic expression. So, um, mm. and when I say Orphic, I'm predating Christianity by a thousand years. Yeah. So, um, and you, are yeah. you as well able to connect that to the Garden of Gethsemane? Because that's it sounds like that's this relates very much to that story. Is that correct? Yeah. And when Jesus, I think Jesus gives it away when he says, um, "Some people are made eunuchs, you know, um, for the kingdom of heaven." Right. Um, if you look at that. Um, as a practice in antiquity, just not just outside of anything you know about Jesus. If you just look at eunuchs and why they're making eunuchs and what eunuchs do, remember the lace days, that child trafficker is the eunuch maker, right? I read an account once and people don't, <laughs> people don't do this, but I read an account of a Thracian pirate, right? And you call them pirate lace days is, you know, you can call them pirate only because they traffic on, um, in the Aegean, right? They traffic in the sea, in the Black Sea, right? It's a, it's just the way that you ship your product around. But he talks about, in this text, he talks about making this beautiful um, new angelic creation, this hermetic creation um, that can be within that kingdom. And it's a kid that he abducted, and then he castrates him, puts him to sleep with the drugs that they've got, and castrates him. And when the kid wakes up, he's a new, um, he's a, a kind of a, a, a new entity. When Jesus says, look, you can get castrated for the kingdom of heaven, that's not like it's un, unusual. None of us apply that today. The last person who applied that was Origen, who cut off his own testicles for the sake of the kingdom of God. He within that context, understood. We don't. The charismatics today, you know, they'll only go so far with the original, right? So they won't do the drugs and they won't do the sex and they won't do it, which makes a lot of people just unsatisfied. But, and they won't go through with the castration. Um, remember, Jesus said, I'll teach you how to drink thanasimon. Thana Simon are those death inducers, right? And people look at that and they think, Jesus is weird, right? Talking and talking, he's talking figuratively. And what exactly did he mean here? No, he's saying, I'll show you how to use those death inducing drugs, right? Remember, Paul gets bitten by the viper and it doesn't do anything to him. That's not a miracle, that's science. Right? He's the biggest junkie on the planet, and he uses junkie terminology just like the rest of them. Right? When Jesus gives that bread to Judas before he betrays him, he's like, look, watch this. He gives it to him, changes his mood, right? and then all of a sudden he runs off, and that's the thing. And Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, read that from the perspective of somebody in antiquity like Nonus who's writing about it, saying that thing was the drugged element. Right? Okay, cool. So he's in an upper room with a bunch of teenage boys. And by the way, he's naked. He takes off his clothes, and when he washes their feet, he dries them with the towel that he wrapped around his waist after he took all his clothes off. Right. And you say, wait a minute. OK, that could be construed as inappropriate. I mean, I would if I went to you didn't have any of that. And as a youth pastor, did you? Did somebody come into you and take off their clothes in front of you when you're in a room with 12 underage kids? 
No, we didn't. But in antiquity, it makes perfect sense within the right. That naked kid that is with Jesus, right? He's got that bandage on his private parts, right? That confusion that, remember what mental state Jesus is in the garden too. He can't take the cup and it's causing him to stumble and fall down. His three apostles over there, Peter, James, and John, that you always think have a beard, they didn't. And they're sitting there and they can't stay awake. He has to come shake them and revive them, bring them. How come you keep falling asleep? And we all look at it as, oh, it's fairy tale. It's Jesus, the guy with the beard. He's kind of blue eyes and white skin. And he's walking and he's, oh, right? No, this is a dude who is tripping, who in five minutes is going to be raising his hand to the cops saying, what'd you come out with me with the swap for? I'm not a lay stace and this naked kid with a bandage on his private parts fall. And by the way, they went to grab the kid and he ran away and the bandage fell off. Right now, I have watched Christians try to explain this. I have written to the heads of um, seminaries to uh, at least the biblical, um, the Greek side of it to try to get a response to this. You know, the best I've gotten the best I've gotten is that Jesus' glory, they were in a cemetery, and Jesus' glory resurrected some naked, dead kid. The kid crawled out of the ground like a zombie. It was, I think he called it a glory bomb. He let off a glory bomb. Do you hear, fundamentalists out there, do you hear how ridiculous you are? This is ridiculous. Um, what's he doing with the naked kid? That's what I want to know. Probably a castration, the stuff that's on his face that um, is described as that thick, congealed, um, dark material, like Haima. Ah, you know, that Haima is also how they describe what comes out of a prepubescent kid's ejaculation. Because everybody knows on the medical side that prepubescent kids don't ejaculate like adults, right? They don't adjust. It's not the same composition. What's going on? Look, what's right? And Galen describes again. I'm um, just like they're describing the mince, not minces, the um, exudate. Um, they, they call the white, I forget it's the white something, of the um, young prepubescent girl. And what is that used for? Right? What does that mean? They had to explain how these things are working within the body and whatnot. And Galen was huge on that. Right? So, you know, when your patient comes into you in antiquity and they've got a problem, the first thing you do is you ask them to pee in a cup. And what do you do after they pee in the cup? You taste it. You smell it first before you taste it. You smell it. And then you taste it. Do you know tasting somebody's urine? will give you an idea of what kind of illness they have. That's what they said. Okay, I'm not personally, I'm not going to be doing that anytime soon, right? Forget about that. But um, that's the environment you're working in. So when that new baby is born in antiquity, you have to get that young girl to come pee, in a container that you can then submerge the baby's head in up to his eyes. And you got to open his eyes under the pee. Why? Because everybody knows you got, you got that stuff on the vagina that we call chlamydia and you can blind your kid. If you're not, you know, if you don't properly clean them off once they get out, so look, this is the world they're in. This is the New Testament. And this is why it's gorgeous and why we should say Christianity has done us such a disservice by taking these texts and turning them into a fairy tale. You'd have never known that about Jesus, right? You'd have never, you'd have never known his drug connections. You'd never know. Mary Magdalene makes no sense otherwise. You know, Magdal and Scythian, means, according to a 16th, 17th century scholar, means um, um, maga. He said it's translated in Greek as maga. It is that witch. It is that one with the power of the drugs to be able to take your mind to a 
outside of what is our time stream, right? It's her that's able to do that. And she's got, why do you think they're saying Jesus is always hanging around with what? Amartaloi, right? He's hanging around with prostitutes. He's hanging around with those people who have connections to what a lay stace would be doing. There's even financial connections. So what, when, you, when you look at the upper room that you mentioned, why do you think it was so important for them to do this ritual where Jesus says, you need to drink my blood and eat my flesh? I mean, I know it's related to the Old Testament uh, you know, rituals, but why do you think that they, they rephrased it that way? And was that possibly related to things like Mithraism, where they were doing some similar rituals? Like, how, Why do you think they made that such a big deal for Christianity? Yeah, what's the difference between a Roman officer urinating into the mouth of another in order to induce a state of communion with divinity? What's the difference between that and Jesus with his 12 boys in the upper room who ends up in a garden with a naked one? And he's younger. He's a Neonisco, so they put a diminutive on the end. Of it. That, kid's, that kid's definitely prepubertal, right? How do you, how does Jesus get from there? He gets the same way. It's the performance of ritual. It's the performance of medicine. It's why he's the great shepherd. It's why he is the great physician, right? Because of that process that he's doing, right? And he doesn't want to take the cup in the end. He doesn't want to take it in the end because it's a painful process. It's a terrible process. But if you want to burn off somebody's mortality, that's what you got to do. So when there's that crowd there, and see, this is rubbing against the culture at the time that is saying, no, 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 this is not good to be profiteering, right, off of this basically slave trade. Um, why do you need to give them that flesh and, and blood ingredient? You can't make people pliable unless you overcome them with a substance, right? How do you think they made those boys pliable? What do you think they do with eunuchs? People think, oh, eunuchs can't get erections. That's not true. That's not true. They get erections. They can do whatever they want with that erection. They just can't get you pregnant, right? Now, depending on how soon you make them eunuchs, you're going to change their sex drive, right? But they can still be functional. What do you think all those Roman matrons do? with their eunuchs, right? That's accepted. When your husband's a senator and he's 40 years older than you, he married you when you were 15, what do you think you do when it's 25 and he's 75? What do you think you do? That's what eunuchs are for, right? That's mm -hmm. part of a soul. It's, it's a, there's such a demand for this in antiquity. They're meeting this demand. And by the way, people talk about, you know, we put in prison teachers that have relations with students for a very good reason. We do that. That phenomenon is sacred in antiquity, right? There's entire cults built around the mother bringing the Addis to maturation. And in the process, he gets castrated. They had a whole group of Baptists, right? Who, what did they do? They would get involved in ceremonies that use drugs, and they would cut off their, they would cut off their testicles, and they they had a um, customs, not really laws, but customs that you can take your testicles and throw them. Right? This is a big party, by the way. This is not, this is not in a church setting, right? This is a big party, and you take your testicles and you throw them into a house, and whatever house you throw them into. That house is obliged by custom to provide you with a woman's wardrobe that you will then wear. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know why we take up the cross? Because we're Baptists. Uh, do you understand that in the mysteries there is sadism? If you don't understand that, um, something you're not seeing antiquity. You're seeing the fairy tale right? That came from it. Um, but that's all you're seeing. You're not seeing genuine and mm. stuff that Jesus said um, won't make sense until you understand the actual words, the actual flavors that he's producing, right? You, you understand nobody here. I guarantee your audience. Nobody knew 
that Jesus raised his hand, unless they've listened to me, that Jesus raised his hands and said, I am not a child trafficker, right? I can show you that word and I can track it through all of Greek literature around it and show you that it means exactly that. Mm -hmm. So it's not odd that Jesus was there. It's not odd that they send a, they send a SWAT unit after him. Right? You think, why? This is Jesus. It's no big deal. Look, he's a nice guy. He's been preaching. Oh, he's been healing. And he's got, oh, right? Because you are following the fairy tale. Romans don't send the crack troops out there when temple authorities can do it theirself, themselves. They're doing it for the sake of the force. And he specifically mentions their use of heavy weapons. Jesus says, why'd you send the group out with heavy weapons? I'm not a lace dace. Right, because guess what? Child trafficking, they use agents to protect themselves. Peter is an agent. And he tried to cut off the dude's ear, right? Took a swing at his head and took off his ear. Right? Oh, you mean they actually used these boys? Remember, it was a child prostitute that recognized Peter. A child prostitute recognized Peter. Okay. All right. The boys from Galilee. I'm beginning to see what the boys from Galilee do and why they spend time on the boat with Jesus. I totally get that. People don't remember the scene when you and I were in Bible school. You remember the scene when Jesus is on the boat and the, the kids are there with him and he's, they're like, oh, it's terrible. We're having a terrible storm. Jesus, Jesus. And he gets up and it says he's pissed. And he says, why'd you do this? And he stands up, rebukes the sea. Everything goes calm, right? Now, if that's a group of 30-year-old men, it's kind of odd. It's a little bit odd. But because they're mathetes, because they're just as children, um, it begins to make a lot more sense. Jesus' power begins to make a lot more sense. Jesus didn't just come, and when he spoke... The power was there. You read the Gospels and you find out he's shepherding around a group of children. He's got total control. And when it comes to the government taking him down, that's he loses all his power. He loses all his power. His own people didn't buy his junk, right? <laughs> Prophets without honor in his own country, right? So what does he do? He goes out in his ministry, Jesus's ministry is about a man grooming children. I'm telling you, the, the, the actual gospel is way more interesting than the fairy tale that we've been given. It's amazing as you describe these things, and I know you're probably in some ways just scratching the, the surface of the surface, but it's amazing when you look at this to think Christians, number one, like you said, they don't really know this, they're looking at the fairy tale, but if they if they really knew even a portion of what was really going on. Like if we could theoretically have had a camera back there, send it back through time on a drone or something and actually watch what was happening. You would look at that and think I'm beyond horrified. Like, Oh my God, what have I been, who have I been following? This guy is a psychopath. He is a criminal. And there's just, there's no way that you would do anything other than send this guy to prison. And yet people today are, just in love with him, in love with his character, praying to him, calling him the lover of their souls, and seeing no weirdness to it all. You know, even even if to me, I like even if you don't know all this stuff, it's like you're even just the communion, the Eucharist as it's given. You're still being told to go pretend. You know, if not, I don't know if you're a Catholic, it's it's actually the transubstantiation. But if you're a Protestant, you know, you're you're going to pretend to eat a dead man's body and drink a dead man's blood, like. Do you not see how weird this is? Like, this is really freaking weird. And yet we all just, because we're like, we, it's, it's, it's a testament, as I like to say, to childhood indoctrination. If you get someone in this young enough, you just think it's all normal. And it's like, no, what, why is it weird? We're just, we're just commemorating the Lord's death and resurrection. But, you know, when you look at this stuff, it, it's, it shocks me. And I, I think it's, it's horrible because I think about the people in it and I think to myself, if you only knew what you were really doing, you would be horrified and you would not only be horrified, you would be 
doing what a lot of us atheists are doing, which is trying to free other minds. It's like, I feel like a bit like Morpheus, you know, like we're freeing people's minds, not because we're angry atheists, not because we hate Christianity. You can't hate Santa Claus. You can't hate the Easter bunny. They're not real, but you can hate the fact that this is psychological child abuse. And in many ways, of course, physical abuse, but it's psychological child abuse. And it is really, really nasty stuff. And they just can't see it. It's it breaks your heart that they can't see it and that they're they're not only willing to accept it but defend it as if as if it's their all in all there's a there's a power to the naked boy that was with jesus i had a street preacher i've got my two kids with me right and i'm in new jersey and I've, i'm walking home after having just fed them dinner and we're gonna get, walk back to our place and there's a street preacher there in the middle street and he is yelling just being loud as he can be and he loves the world and i'm like okay i'm, I'm just gonna keep walking and he reached out to me and he said brother would you like to talk about the bible and i said look you know okay fine so i said yeah i have a question for you and he said what's your question brother he kept calling me brother i wasn't his brother he said hey um what's your question about the Bible? And I said, what was Jesus doing in a public park at 4 a.m. with a naked boy? And he said, he looked at me and the look in his eyes was like total contempt. And he laughed. He got a smile on his face. And he laughed and he said, brother, which I hated him doing again. He said, brother, it was disingenuous. Brother, that's not in the Bible. That's not in my Bible. And I said, do you have a Bible? And he said, hold it out of his hands, a little red one, a little King James Dealey, right? And he, Gideon pulled it out. I said, look at Mark 14, 51 and 52. Okay. Both my kids were standing with me looking at him, right? You could see in his face as he read the verses to himself. You could see in his face a transformation for a brief moment. He came to the realization that Jesus was a creep and that he's been pushing his entire um, uh, um, motivation and life is all about this creep. You can see it for just a minute. And he just, he went forlorn looking, his countenance dropped. He kind of, kind of went empty on the inside, right? And I'm trying not to smile because I can see the I can see a soul's death. Do you know what it's like? It's one thing to convert somebody and to bring somebody to Christ. You know what's way more fulfilling? Giving somebody that dose of reality and bringing them back. That's way more facilitating. That guy was never going to be the same. Never going to be the same. Um, we walked away from it with him saying, you're a pervert. And I was like, look, bro, it's your Bible. <laughs> <laughs> your Lord and Savior is a pervert. Wow. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. And there's, I, again, I know it, it, part of this, too, is like we're just scratching the surface. That's one story of dozens, if not hundreds, we could look at where there's issues upon issues upon issues. And then you're, you know, going into issues with Paul and endless issues there. But it's, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways from this that I love is just when you... And I, I, I know we talked before the recording about how other people do this for me, but I love how there's this sense of a scope for the imagination to say like, you know, we're not, we're not saying here that we understand every little thing of how this text was created originally or how it evolved. We don't know who all had it. We don't know some of the changes that could have occurred. And, and I would argue that, that it's probably likely that there's some pretty significant cover-ups that have occurred, but knowing what we do have, knowing what we do know, people like you bring bring us the viewers to a point of just saying, look, there's more to this than, you know, there's a context. You don't know the context, but you, arguably you should have been told the context. You didn't have it. And when you get it, it doesn't make you into some kind of genius where you know everything and you're not necessarily ready to make conclusions. It just makes you say, huh, there's a lot more to this story than I ever imagined. And it, I love that because that's in many ways, that's, Part of my deconversion process was just saying, what if these stories are something different? You know, when I realized, for example, that from Dr. Dennis McDonald's work, 
that the Gospels and Acts are in many ways copying Homer and Euripides. It's like, wait a second. And it's, it's not like you can necessarily draw conclusions yet. You're just saying there's more to this story. Why is he quoting Plato and all these other people in the Gospels? It doesn't, it, it just, you realize it's different from the party line and the narrative that you've been given. And it, it does, it helps you wake up. I mean, it really is, it's, it's funny, you painted all those pictures of like the, the drug inducing experience. But in many ways, this is a similar death to life experience just without the drugs, arguably, that or the, you know, the drugs that, that are in your brain. But saying th th it's the drug of, of reality and the drug of saying, I am absolutely stinking sick of being lied to, of having, you know, one one thousandth of the information I should have been given. And if I'm going to, you know, if you, Mr. Preacher, are going to tell me that I need to effectively swing out onto eternity on this rope swing of the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, and that's what's going to get me over the pit of hell to the you know, banks of Jordan to heaven. If that's what's going to save me, then you need to tell me where did this thing come from? What is what is actually happening here? And it's it's just it comes down to almost like a fairness issue. Like it's not fair to tell millions and billions of people for two thousand years these stories, and you have no idea where it came from. And I, I say that to my own shame too. Like I did it. I preached a lot, and I didn't know where it was from. But you come to a point where you have to say. I need to take responsibility for this until I say one more word about the gospel. I need to know what is this thing? Where did it come from? Who wrote it? If I can know how did it evolve and what's actually in that text, like you're so good at. And I just, I love it. It's, it's such a beautiful thing to, to kind of wake up. Don't you see as a pastor, um, there's a recklessness. I feel the same. I think that's probably why you asked me, do you feel guilty? Because there's a recklessness with you not knowing. You say, I didn't know. And of course, I didn't know either. I wasn't born with this, right? Yep. I didn't know either. And I was converting people, right? Do I feel a little bit bad about that conversion? I understand why you're saying that because it is reckless. And I think that's the spirit that Celsus is talking about too when he's condemning Christianity. You are taking somebody and you're putting them into a state where you will affect their mental development. You will cut off nature and you will cut off everything that is beautiful, like reason. You'll cut it off from them, right? Oh, God. And Paul is walking around. This is why you worship the creature and the creation. Don't worship the creation, right? It's control. Were, were you and I involved in that? Did you? I kind of feel like I was just a cog in that mechanism. Should I feel bad about it? now? Because you asked me, maybe I'm going to feel, maybe I'm going to feel a little bit that way, but you and I both worked in the circles of that actual mystery, that thing that is there buried underneath Christianity. We were part of that history, and yeah, we were on the wrong side, right? We were on the ugly side, but, and, you know, both of us figured out a way to come out of it, right? To Maybe maybe we owe that. Do we owe that, Tim, to the people that we converted? Do you owe them some kind of, you know, we need to go back and talk to these people? Is that what you're doing with your show? Are you kind of expunging that culpability of perpetuating that brain virus. Yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely am. I, I did go back to as many people as I could. Uh, and I knew some of them would not be in any way interested in, in hearing from me. So those people that I was crystal clear on, like anything I said, you will truly be bouncing off of you. But I, I knew there were some people that were searching and I did go back to some people and I, I literally had some people say, yeah, I, I you know, like one guy, for example, was really gracious. Um, I'm from Philadelphia and, and he'd, he'd moved to a different state at that point. But, um, I'd heard through the grapevine that he had kind of questioned the narrative. He'd heard some things about, you know, which version of the Old Testament Jesus was quoting from with the Septuagint, and it led him down some rabbit trails that kind of made him question it and uh, how the Septuagint doesn't match up with certain of the Old, Old Testament texts. And he's like, wait a second. It's, and it, it, it eventually led him to deconstruct heavily. I don't know if he'd call himself an atheist, but by the time I spoke with him and and apologized to him he, he was very gracious he said look number one you were doing the best you could at the time with what you knew it's like you don't have anything to apologize for in a sense he's like i understand why you're calling me and i forgive you and that was awesome that was awesome to hear that but in the in the in the bigger picture of this channel i like to phrase it this way if i put a thousand people in the kingdom i want to take a hundred thousand back out like and i want to save the next generation or or maybe a better way to put it that i, I say a lot 
I want to leave this planet better than I found it. Like I found it steeped in mythology and I want to help end it. And I, I know my, my waves will be small in the big picture, but if there's enough of us making waves, it could become a tsunami. And especially when I think about the politics stuff and the Christian nationalism, that the insanity that the people with their fingers on the buttons of the most powerful weapons on this planet believe in, in the Trinity and in the Eucharist. And it's like, really like you, you are mythology. You are, you are, your whole worldview is steeped in mythology and you have the nuclear codes. Are you kidding me? Like that doesn't make sense. And I feel like for the sake of our future, we at least have to try. And um, I, I do feel like it's been an amazing journey to help people to, to who are maybe a lot of them probably the, by the time they come to my channel, they're already halfway out the door. But a few people have come to me and said like, you, you it was actually you that got me out, like me directly. I, I've had at least two or three people say that where they said, I wasn't really deconverting until I heard your channel and you took me all the way out. I'm like, you know, praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Praise <laughs> the Lord, right? Yeah, that's a you're a man of justice and nemesis. That's what I would say from antiquity. If those guys were resurrected and looking at you, they'd say this look at this man naturally follows DK, right? We understand who he is. Come be a part of the civilization, right? Bring this, bring this defense of reason and beauty. Love it. Love it. I maybe I should be a little bit more that way. I'm more just a reveler in the in the underbelly. You know what I mean? I love the dark and dirty stuff. And when Ezekiel gets dirty and he gets, oh God, some of the stuff they're saying, you don't understand it unless you get the sexual rights that they're doing. Yeah. Right. So it's amazing. Um, but yeah, maybe we owe it, Tim. You've made me, you've given me, you've given me a reason to stop and to thank. Maybe we owe um the world for every convert we made maybe we owe 10 i don't know 100 how many do we owe um i don't know it's worth opening the eyes and if you you know the the great thing that i feel about you is you can tell that you came to that point that um you wanted others to be woken up you wanted them you know you really are in the service of the devil you know what I mean? You really are. I want you to consider that you may actually be in the service of the devil because what is he doing? He's the one who's saying, God's a liar. Um, this stuff is not going to kill you, right? It's mm. going to open, it's going to open your eyes and you're going to see. And he doesn't like that. Remember he said he didn't want their eyes open, right? Why? Because they would be like us, right? <laughs> I love it, baby. Let's start it. Uh, yeah. You start on your end with the the movement that you're pushing forward that you've, you know, you've got a ton of momentum on. And I'll start on the satanic end. Somewhere we'll make a renaissance and people, will, you know, people will be free from this garbage. You know what I mean? Yeah, we'll meet in the middle. I, I was just going to say, too, with what you were just saying, um, it makes me think, uh, it takes us back to Plato's cave. Like, it's time. It's, it's time to walk out. It's time to walk out of the shadows and get into the light. And one of the things that happens a lot on this channel, I, I ask quite often, at least I used to, uh, is can you please, now that we're done your whole story, can you please compare and contrast your sense of peace when you were a Christian versus your sense of peace now? And by and large, the, the vast majority uh, would say, oh, the, the peace that I have now that I've escaped is so much greater. I've, I've got a few people that have said something a little different where they're like, I just really wanted, you know, I, I wanted to see my loved ones in the afterlife. I wanted heaven. Most people are like, I, I feel so much freedom. Just, just the sense that's like you win the lottery. Like I could have gone, I could have easily seen that if the chips had fallen differently, I could have easily stayed stuck in this till the day I died. And, and literally in a sense, never lived a day of my life for real. And I've at least got some time left. And I, I think that's, that's kind of where I personally am with it. And I just, I love the chance to hopefully help some other people feel like there's some freedom to this, but I know I've kept it for a while. I do want to ask real quick before we wrap up, could you do a, just a quick plug for your YouTube channel, Lady Babylon? And then maybe after that, just any uh, thing you want to say about your books and any other projects, any books that might be coming out in the next year or two or big projects on your horizon, just so we can kind of know how we can connect with you from here. Yeah. If anybody wants to connect with me, you're going to have to do it in a way that you don't spend any money because I am right now not monetized i could be but i'm not monetized and i won't monetize on youtube 
I want you, I have a channel called Lady Babylon 666. And on that channel, I all I do is I bring the Greek sources to the people. I've got 150 people that sit there and love it. It's scrumptious. We just throw out the Greek and we bring the reality. And it's so shocking. And I, of course, you know me, I have to pick the most shocking and the most, ooh, those texts that just, they bring that reality back to life. That's Lady Babylon 666 on YouTube. You can buy, don't buy my work. Don't, if you want to read The Chemical Muse, get a pirated copy of it. It's like $600. And you, you don't need that, people. We're all poor, right? Okay, so check me out on Lady Babylon. Leave a comment, especially if you think that um, I'm going to hell because those are that's delicious. I love that stuff. And I love it when you, people step in and pretend to be able to do the Greek because I love, uh, uh, there's something about it. There's something about well, that freedom once we are out of the fear of the religion, all of those fruits of life become that much more delicious. I love it. I couldn't appreciate, Tim, I couldn't appreciate womankind until I deconverted. Yeah, definitely. And then I was like, oh, this is wonderful, right? Love it, love it. So Lady Babylon, mm. pirate chemical muse if you need to. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I just wanted to, uh, I want to say a joke and then I want to wrap up. Um, you know how they would people would often say in church at the end, and all God's people said, Amen. I was love I love how your name is so close we could say, and all the atheists said, Amen. I love it. Um, uh, well, th thank you so much. Thank you for what you're doing for the community. It's priceless. We love you. We love what you're doing. We love your energy. We love your 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 questions, your your the way that you bring bring us to a point of saying, huh, so much. It's just like, wow, we're, we're, I, I love the amaze factor. You have a mind that is just beautiful. And I, I hope you will not stop anytime soon. We love what you're doing. Please keep at it. And I'm definitely going to be getting the books that I can afford before too long and trying to pick up uh, just, you know, gleaning from the, the beautiful things you've done for us. I love it. And I mean, to me, like you, you, you wove into the interview, so much of this is, is now that you've deconverted and gotten past your angry atheist phase, like go back. This book has layers and nuances that you've never seen there. And it's actually more amazing than you ever thought. It's just not, you know, you're, it doesn't have to be your worldview, but it's an amazing thing to study and, and learn from. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, really appreciate it. Everyone have the links beneath this interview for for uh, for Dr. Hillman's videos uh, and his website. Do you have any final things you want to add before we wrap up? I just wanted to say thank you. And thank you for the integrity that you bleed. Um, it's an honor to be able to do this with you. So thank you, Tim. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, privilege is mine as well. Everyone we've been speaking with Dr. Amin. Did I say it right? Yeah. No, you got it. You got it. Just call me Amin, baby. <laughs> Everyone we've been speaking with Amin, uh, Dr. Amin Hillman. Dr. Hillman, thank you so much. Great to hear your story. Great to get to know you. I would definitely like to do it again sometime. I'll, I'll get some of your books and I'll get some better questions for next time. But thank you so much for today. Awesome to get to know you. I got a lot of respect for you, Tim. I got a lot of respect for you. And that's... Uh... That's that's gold in the real world. That that integrity that you've got is gold. The very fact that you and I have been to that place and come out of it, I think that builds character, and I I, I love it. I love to hear that in a in a person. I love it. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you so much. We'll do it again sometime. Okay, sounds good. Anytime. Have a good day.